is that power and decision making around climate change is largely held by people who are white, middle class and often male. Um, yet the people who are most on the front line of climate change um, are often excluded from those decision making spaces, which is of course itself a huge social justice issue. Thanks, Tim. So the, the heat waves that we had earlier this year, I think are a great insight into the sort of complexity of climate change for, for vulnerable communities. So as Rachel mentioned, in this summer of 2022, we had 13 days of 40 degree plus temperatures in Perth and a record number of days over 35. It's the hottest summer on record. Now, different people experience this heat, heat wave differently because vulnerability depends on your exposure to heat, your sensitivity to heat and your ability to keep cool. Now, I've done a, a, an analysis of the literature over the last decade looking at heat waves, and um, there are some quite interesting and um, complex social justice impacts. So we know that heat, he, there are significant health impacts of heat waves. This can range from heat cramps and heat exhaustion to heat stroke, um, hypothermia, or a whole range of other issues, including, sadly, death. Um, the literature really shows that that these issues are particularly strong for people who already experienced disadvantage around income, age, ability, level of English and location. We also know that there are mental health impacts of heat waves with people um, more likely to be experiencing anxiety, fear, depression and stress. Some groups of people have difficulties regulating their body temperature, for example, elderly people, pregnant women and people with disabilities. And this has come through in various different studies. We also now know that there is increased family and domestic violence during heat waves as well. A key issue that I think is probably the most obvious to us all is that um, heat waves can cause significant financial stress. So people on low incomes are more likely to live in low quality housing that's energy inefficient, often without insulation or air conditioning. And people on low incomes also have decreased financial resources to be able to respond to extreme heat with issues around high energy costs with using the air conditioner um, and the um, financial implications of seeking out cool places if their home doesn't provide that. There's also issues around adequacy of shelter and poor quality housing for people as they are navigating um, the heat wave in, in the moment. Power outages can be particularly harmful for people with disability as they have a greater reliance on electricity. And transport and car ownership is really important as well, because if people don't have a car, particularly in rural and remote areas with no public transport, then it makes it very difficult for them to seek to adapt to climate change. So a lot of us, for example, when we have a heat wave, we'll um, head down to the beach or go to the river to cool down. But if you don't have a vehicle to do that, that then means that it's um, much more difficult for you to find ways to cool if your home doesn't provide that for you. There's also increasingly literature around the impacts of heat waves on people of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, um, particularly around challenges adapting to heat, especially when they live in homes without air conditioning and if they're unfamiliar with the local climate. So new migrants may not have access to language, to, to health advice in, in a language that they can understand or that they can access. Um, and due to systemic racism and other experiences in public places, they may avoid public air conditioned places like shopping centres. And if their swimming capacity or ability isn't particularly strong, then they may be at risk at beaches and in swimming pools. We also know that some people can be excluded from air conditioned places. For example, in the climate health inquiry led by the WA government last year, a couple of years ago, um, they found that people experiencing homelessness were increasingly moved on by security guards in supermarkets and shopping centres, although this was the place where they were going to become cool. And finally, there are some work-related risks when working in unsafe environments when exposed to heat. And if people have job insecurity or working casually, dropping a fish, uh, dropping a shift in order to escape the heat can in fact be cause, cause a significant amount of financial stress. So um, if we just move on, thanks, Tim. This is just a snapshot. There is um, quite a lot of evidence um, to, that it really gives us insight into these issues. And I, I really urge you to have a look at this report written by VCOS last year around heat waves. And they gave a suggestion, a, a, quite a number of, of policy recommendations for how governments can be more adequately responding to heat waves for the, in the context of social justice and vulnerable communities. One example is um, around increasing residential energy efficiency. And there's a great opportunity, I think, for the community sector to be partnering with um, the climate movement and with 
uh, the, some of the other advocacy movements around energy efficiency and around housing. Um, obviously, with social housing and rental properties, if, if they aren't, don't have adequate uh, insulation or air conditioning or they are, you know, constructed to a really poor standard, that creates, as I've shown, a whole range of social justice impacts for people living in those homes. And so there's a great opportunity to really be campaigning for better housing um, standards, particularly for rentals. Thanks, Tim. So I could speak for hours around what are just climate solutions and what does it mean, you know, really to prosecute an argument for um, a climate justice um, response in this context. It's obvious that we have an urgent need for just policies and actions to address the multiple dimensions of inequality under climate change. Um, I won't read all of these out, but I will just touch on a couple. Um, the climate movement is being challenged, I think, very strongly about the importance of solidarity with First Nations peoples around land rights and sovereignty and treaty, and that this is a really necessary precondition um, for collectively tackling the climate crisis and for um, social justice really to be achieved you know, in the context of climate action. There's a lot of discussion as well around the just transition from coal extraction and other fossil fuel extraction. And we are seeing, for example, in Western Australia, we have a, a just transition plan for Collie that the state government is implementing. Some of the research that ECU is doing with the Climate Justice Union in the Collie community is about broadening this understanding of just transition, not just focusing on the, a just transition or a fair transition for the workers involved in the industry, but thinking about it much more comprehensively for the whole community. So what is a just transition from coal for people on low incomes in Collie? And what's a just transition for um, young people and children and um, for people with disability, people that we don't traditionally think of as part of the coal industry, except that, of course, in a small community like Collie, everyone is affected by economic change. Again, I think that the community sector has a really important role in, in, in influencing the way that we understand transition and just transition. And finally, I'll just focus on one more area as well. Um, there is quite a movement. Naomi, one one minute. Sure. There's, I can see, could see your, your face, Rachel. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of focus in, in the, the climate space in Australia around the transition to renewable energy systems. And, um, you know, I, sometimes I refer to this as the techno patriarchy because it's, it's so focused on technology that people are often left behind from that discussion. If we transition to a private energy system that still continues to perpetuate the way that we manage energy in this country, the way that private companies have a dominance um, in, in the sector, then we, might, we actually won't be addressing the underlying causes and manifestations of climate change. And so a just approach to the, the transition to renewable energy is about that, re that energy being safe, about being decentralised and about being community owned. And with that sort of approach, we're, much, we're bringing, putting people at the centre and communities at the centre and ensuring that our values of social justice manifest through everything that we're doing when we're navigating the climate crisis. I might leave it there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Naomi. That was fantastic. And, and there's so much more that we need to do in this space. I'd now like to invite Mason Rothwell to uh, talk to us around is specifically youth justice. Now we know this is, has been a very important issue for a long time, but it's really, again, another issue that's really come to the fore over the last 12 months and has been a lot of focus on it and most immediately in the last couple of months. So uh, we're lucky enough to have, in fact, two speakers on youth justice. We have uh, Mason, who I'll introduce in a minute, and we also have uh, Jay Lee Snowden, uh, who uh, is going to also speak uh, speak to us. I'll introduce her separately after Mason. But first off, I'll introduce Mason. Um, Mason is uh, uh, working at both the uh, Social Investment WA and Yakwa. So he brings a vast amount of experience in the policy space. He's a senior policy advisor at Social Reinvestment WA. And he's, and he's been involved with uh, Social Investment WA for four years. And as I said, he also works um, on policy as the policy and advocacy manager at the Youth Affairs Council of WA. Sorry, I used the, short, the acronym before with YAQA. Mason has a wealth of social policy experience and has previously worked 
for the Mental Health Commission and the Victorian Department of Premier and, Ca and Cabinet. I'll hand over to you, Mason. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that bio was far too kind. Can everybody hear me? Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to begin um, just by acknowledging that I'm presenting to you all from Wajuk Noongar Bujo, um, where I grew up, where I live today. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and extend that to um, any other lands that anyone else is joining from today. Um, in particular, I'd also like to uh, just briefly acknowledge that when we talk about justice uh, in Australia and we talk about youth justice, um, we inevitably must talk about Aboriginal communities um, and Aboriginal young people because of the disproportionate effects and representation. Um, and that, um, that discussion is often framed in a deficit narrative. It's around poorer outcomes, fewer services, higher rates of criminalisation, um, and that doesn't arise from a vacuum. Um, we can uh, directly uh, link those with um, colonisation, experiences of racism and discrimination, stolen generations, stolen wages, stolen land. Um, and that's very important for us to acknowledge, especially um, uh, for myself as a white person working in this space. Um, as well, um, as I'll get into in this presentation, um, we see great outcomes when we pass power back to Aboriginal communities, um, when we support self-determination and we support Aboriginal community controlled efforts um, around their own communities and their own futures. Um, so please keep that in mind um, throughout today. Um, next slide, Tim. Thank you. Um, so youth justice um, as a system in Western Australia um, is in a funny spot. Um, right now, it's highly focused on punitive measures um, that provide services for probably the most vulnerable young people um, on a very pointy end of the spectrum. Um, and it's very similar um, to what we've seen in the mental health space um, previously. Um, for starters, our legislative system um, unfairly criminalises young people. Currently, our minimum age of criminal responsibility uh, in WA and mostly across the nation is set at 10 years of age, uh, meaning that children as young as 10 can and do go to prison um, in Western Australia, um, sometimes for crimes uh, as minor as stealing a chocolate bar. Um, internationally, um, medical experts, legal experts and human rights experts have weighed in on this um, and decided that the absolute minimum floor for that criminal age of responsibility should be 14 years of age, um, and that is the absolute minimum. And that's based on neurological evidence around frontal cortex development, the ability to make decisions, um, to consider um, the impacts of decisions. Um, and WA and Australia's age of criminal responsibility has received international condemnation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are disproportionate effects on certain cohorts of, in youth justice, um, particularly around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people who are 16 times more likely to be under justice supervision. Um, WA has some of the higher rate, highest rates in the nation. Um, and again, that is related to experiences of colonisation. Um, as well, um, we know that it, um, uh, over-policing um, is particularly affecting um, low socioeconomic um, areas and young people, um, as well as uh, people of colour uh, and other communities. Um, with our justice system being so focused on punitive efforts, um, the vast majority of spending goes towards those punitive, punitive responses. Um, it costs about $991 per day to imprison a young person um, at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre, which is WO's only um, youth detention centre. It's based here in the metropolitan area, um, but at only about $60 per day to supervise them in the community. And those rates are a little variable, but the cost savings is massive. Um, so really what we're saying here is we're spending a lot of money um, on a system that is so focused um, on that heavy intervention and that crisis end um, and it's not really achieving outcomes um, so if we can go to the next slide Tim so what we're finding um, when we actually look at our youth justice system is that despite how much we're spending we're not seeing the sustained outcomes that we want to see for young people um, we have instability and human rights abuses here at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre um, so youth detention WA has come under repeated fire the inspector of custodial services has um, conducted about eight reports on the centre since 2012, um, finding there's a repeated cycle of stability um, and instability um, with dips and valleys, um, and recently um, a rising critical incidence at the centre that has been exacerbated by COVID-19 workforce shortages, uh, among other things, um, resulted in a review that was released just this month, uh, which found that the centre had actually breached human rights of young people um, and breached international standards around uh, time out of cell. So these were 15-year-olds, um, uh, 14-year-olds um, who were kept in their cells for 22 or 23 hours a day. So that's been only being allowed out for, for an hour at a time for a shower at most. Um, and the education services are dipped. 
Um, they're really, um, there are emerging findings that we're having uh, quite poor standards of care as well. Uh, 2018 research found that 90% of young people who end up in Bankshire Hill Detention Centre um, had some form of cognitive impairment, such as FASD. Um, and the majority of those were not diagnosed prior. Um, so they actually weren't incorporated into young people's care planning um, and into the supports that they were receiving, um, such as their education services, such as the plans for what services they'd be connected with afterwards. Um, and so it comes to the question that we asked, why is this not being picked up earlier in the system? Why is this not being picked up in the community to prevent young people from ending up in prison, um, to prevent them, um, or why is this not being identified in courts and sentencing? Um, so there are major systemic issues here uh, in terms of the fact that young people aren't receiving individualized care. Um, as well, we know that prison uh, in general is just not a supportive environment for any young person. Um, there are, there's a high amount of research that shows that prison is a traumatising environment um, and that young people in Bankshire Hill Detention Centre, the majority of them return within two years. Um, so prison is costly. It's not providing a good standard of care. Uh, and it's also not actually working to, to benefit that community safety argument. Next slide, Tim. So our current approach isn't working. Um, we've asked ourselves, um, what if we were to address the underlying causes of offending? There really just has to be a better way. Um, and there's a bit of a direction that we've been looking into at Social Reinvestment WA around what we want to see invested in and what we want to see our youth justice system look like. Um, and primarily what we want to see is current youth justice responses um, broadened. Uh, youth justice responses really shouldn't just be criminalisation punitive responses, but we need mental health responses. We need education responses. We need responses that look at families, communities, and services, um, and that's where we want to go. Next slide, Tim. There's currently um, some reforms that are underway um, that I want to acknowledge and touch on here. Um, and unfortunately, what we want to see is an expansion of this in, in a really large scale form. Um, so firstly, there was an announcement of about $25 million being invested in Bankshire Hill um, on new infrastructure renovations and improvement to Aboriginal services. And um, we really welcome this. We know that we need to improve the environment of Bankshire Hill um, immediately, but the solution to this doesn't lie within the walls of a prison. Um, so what we need to do is we actually need to prevent young people from entering prison um, and we need to get them out of there. Um, and so we're advocating for um, removing anybody under 14. Um, there is rumblings of um, WA uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility. It was adopted as a WA Labor Party platform last year, um, but we're yet to see a commitment for this um, into legislation, um, as well as what age would be raised. And we're fighting really hard that 14 is the minimum standard and we will not go any lower than that. As well, we've seen some reform from the Department of Justice in terms of a strategy for youth justice services, a model of care for Bankshire Hill Detention Centre, but that hasn't had that wide co-design focus and that whole of government approach that we wanna see. Next slide, Tim. So we, uh, we have that um, three main asks um, and we have many, many asks underneath these, um, but these are the, the best ones that I could distill for today. So first is co-designing a cross-sector youth justice framework, bringing in all the relevant government departments and agencies, mental health, education, housing, homelessness, um, WA police, but also bringing in the sector, bringing in young people, bringing in local communities um, and bringing in the sector as part of that. We want to raise the age of criminal responsibility and we want to see an investment in place-based community-led solutions that are addressing those underlying causes of offending. Um, and we've seen that um, work with great success in programs like Oliver Degetta, which you can look up online, um, which is based in Halls Creek, um, and through the uh, employment of youth night officers who are out in the community. It's an Aboriginal control program. Um, they've actually seen about 50% reduction in uh, offences like burglaries uh, within Halls Creek within a year. Um, next slide. So we have a number of principles um, of a better way of doing youth justice that we want to see in any kind of reform. Um, number one is co-design as mentioned, so equal partnership with communities, young people um, and others. We want to see a prioritisation of those therapeutic approaches, um, so moving away from punishment um, and investing in supports, so counselling supports that actually may remain with people throughout their lives. Um, we want to see individualised care. Um, if you talk to any youth worker um, who's in this area, um, they'll let you know that um, they can generally identify the young people who will be involved in the youth justice system about five years before they actually are. Um, so we can be sharing data in a smarter way to actually target interventions um, really appropriately, but without leaning into over-policing. Um, we want no wrong door, so help whenever a young person needs it, wherever they access. Self-determination is really critical if we want to address over-representation of Aboriginal people. Um, that's about community partnerships. It's handing power back to communities. Um, it's about supporting Aboriginal communities to lead their own futures and giving them the skills, the resources and the funding together to do that.
Um, and of course, social reinvestment. So addressing the underlying causes of offending. Next slide. I know I've got a, a minute, Rachel. Um, so what approach do we need? We're recommending um, a rewrite essentially of um, the way that we do youth justice from prevention through to um, detention and reintegration. Um, so we want community development, place-based, assets-based community development that build healthy, happy communities. So for young people and their families. Uh, early intervention uh, for young people at risk, We'd like to see individualised support uh, upon engagement with uh, WA Police, and that might look like embedding youth workers um, as independent bodies uh, within, youth, uh, within police on the beat. Um, the uh, Youth Policing Division at WA Police is doing a great job, and we want to see an expansion of that kind of approach. Uh, we'd like to uh, invest in diversionary um, and alternative sentencing programs, um, such as family group conferencing from New Zealand, um, and of course, therapeutic secure care as a last resort. So focus on rehabilitation, less like a prison, more like a school, and only when required. Next slide. So this is the end of my presentation. I'll keep it really brief. Um, what kind of role can you play? Um, I'd like to invite everyone to join the, the campaign to raise the age. You can find more on that on Social Reinvestment WA's website. Um, we need to push for that hard. Please share it with your members, talk about it in your networks um, with decision makers um, and let them know that 14 is an absolute minimum um, that we'll accept. Mother's Day, we're doing a day of action for this on May 7th. We'll be posting a video and series of social media. Um, please join us in this. Um, share it as, well, as much as you can. Um, and finally, we're looking to gather everybody together um, uh, from government, researchers, community, NGOs, service providers um, to attend a summit to actually talk about what we want to see in youth justice, to talk about what this reform looks like. Um, and we're looking at hosting that on late June. So save the date for 29th of June um, and hope to see you there. That's um, it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mason. And I don't think that bio was overly generous at all. It was clearly spot on. Um, thank you so much. I'd now like to introduce and invite Jay Lee Snowden to um, talk to us. Jay Lee was born and raised in Perth, in obviously here in Western Australia on Noongar Her mother is a Koori woman born in Burke, New South Wales, from the Nambar people. And her dad was a Maori man belonging to the Napuhi tribe from Raha Fita in the Bay of Isles in New Zealand. She was, in, she was enrolled in an entrance program at Murdoch University when her son first went to Banksia Hill in 2017. She now has a Bachelor of Science, majoring in psychology and minoring in psychological criminology and has just begun her honours year. She's supporting the Raise the Age campaign because too many of our children are losing connection with their families and being hardened and desensitised by the appalling conditions of Australia's juvenile detention centres, and in particular, Banksia Hill. Over to you, Jaylee. Oh, thanks for that intro, Rachel, and good one, Mason. Great presentation. Okay, so um, I'd like to also start with an acknowledgement to country. Um, Kaya, Wajak, Nyungam, Rot, Karajini, Kura Kura, Ye Banang Balap, Nijabuja, Karajini. I acknowledge the Noongar people of Wajak Nation long ago now and in the future, they care for country. So, hi everyone. So, you've heard my intro. My name's Jaylee Snowden. I'm a Kuri Maori York. I'm an honours student. I work part time at the Aboriginal Legal Service in the Family Law Unit as a court officer, and I'm a mother of three. But tragically, over five years ago, my children's dad passed away as a death in custody. And since then, our lives have changed abruptly and our new journey began. So today I'd like to speak to you about my personal experience with the justice system and how it has affected me, my son and my family. A week after my children's dad's death, um, my son was arrested and taken to Bankshire for the first time. This is the first time he'd been away from his family and he was still in year nine, only 14 years old. And I was concerned with him falling behind at school and I would ask him if he's going to school, what's he learning in there? And he'd tell me it was, it was so dumb, it's for dumb people and that he's doing primary school work and very basic maths and reading. So there's clearly a lack of education inside. Um, there's a lack of opportunity to learn. And then I stressed to him, do your work, make sure you do everything you can to keep up so you can finish school when you get out. And he had his 15th birthday in Bankshire and was released four months after. 
And as a result of his time in there and what he'd missed, he didn't graduate year 10, much to my dismay. So upon release, it was hard for him to get to readjust and reconnect back in the community. He had strict supervision orders and a strict curfew. He had to do urinalysis um, every week that was at the hospital and not like at a local path lab. Um, and these were responsibilities not only for him, but for us as a family, because we all experienced it and we all had to work together to meet these requirements. Um, and it also included him reporting three times a week, seeing his juvenile justice worker, um, going to counselling sessions. And these appointments were very clinical and mainstream and in offices, which were like sterile waiting rooms. Um, and the professionals and practitioners there um, have no concept of his cultural connections or his disconnections and, and his adolescent needs. Uh, Bankshire Hill treats and punish our kids like adults under strict conditions, though look at them and teach them like babies, incapable of growing and learning. So my son missed out on, in, on important cultural connections when he was inside in prison because um, we would travel to New South Wales every year back to my mum's country for school holidays and native title business. And I feel these are important milestones for his development and self-identity um, where important attachments and bonding to kin and country occur. Um, and in my nan's country, in my mum's country, where her brothers and sisters live, where my aunties and uncles come from and where I used to go as a kid. And at such a crucial age, everyone is getting older, including himself, and the relationships are harder to establish once kids have grown up and elders have passed on. And there are significant cultural events that take place, which become a rite of passage. And there's a lot of knowledge and experience that is learnt and to be shared and not being part of it adds to the disconnection he may feel, which hinders his development of identity and belonging. Instead, he knows and identifies with the struggle of complying with the justice system, which act to disempower our youth and place them in situations that are uncomfortable and meaningless to them. Um, yeah, uh, navigating social systems takes a level of maturity. And for Aboriginal people, if interventions are to be effective, they have to step away from being westernised so that participants feel the focus and purpose of attending and receiving these services are for their benefit, not just to satisfy or tick a box for the system, which takes away power from them. I feel my son still needs to acknowledge and connect with his cultural, on his cultural journey, which although it's hindered due to him missing out on important, important family events, it's important that this happens to strengthen and ground his sense of identity and belonging. So I advocate for my son as much as I can. He's very mature and wise, though he struggles with meeting the expectations of being young and finding his independence. Because of his legal obligations, he must report every week to the police station, attend job networks, places fortnightly, um, and some of his appointments conflict. And if he doesn't have and he doesn't have that authority or interpersonal skills to challenge the system and hold them accountable for their mistakes or to simply negotiate with them. Uh, the language and processes used by these services can be very triggering, especially for young people. Though he's very insightful and aware of his responsibilities, there are syst systemic and procedural barriers that may affect the way he lives. For example, there was a conflict of dates of his appointment and court appearance. He informed them that he had court and didn't go to an appointment, but they stopped his payment anyway. And I had to come into the centre and show them a text message from his lawyer saying his matter was adjourned. So uh, these, these situations speak to critical theory where there's a major imbalance of power and lack of agency for our young people dealing with gov governmental departments and systems which decimate our rights to self-determination. I found my drive and purpose through my son's experience. It was this reason that had made me want to change and better myself. Starting with me, I can have an impact on my family, my community, my people, and others who may be struggling without support or without the tools of education or without the voice of confidence 
and those who aren't ready to speak their stories and tell their truths, I can and will be their voice. So to wrap it up, um, I'd like to acknowledge the Aurora Education Foundation and Justice Reinvest New South Wales for giving me the opportunity to go back to my mum's country of Burke in my first year of undergrad in 2018 and participate in an internship for four weeks at the Maranooka Community Hub. This opportunity and experience broadened my horizons and opened my eyes to focus on social justice needs within our communities all over Australia. I met and witnessed the work of great advocates and leaders like Mick Gooda and Alistair Ferguson and James Moore and many more passionate community members and culturally competent service providers collaborating and working hard on the ground at the grassroots level. Um, they are the experts and they live and operate within their communities. Therefore, they have the relationships with the people and understand access limitations and barriers of how services operate and can be provided to their communities. Therefore, they can drive the solutions and cater for their needs. In saying this, how do we use this model of justice for investment and apply it to our communities here in Western Australia? I am involved in conversations with the Social Reinvestment WA Working Group, which are super proactive and drive these initiatives, such as the one in Olibud Dugetha in Halls Creek. So I'd like to thank you all for the high level of advocacy and collaboration of all the vested stakeholders here, we, which are already having an impact on the ground with the community and through you all being here and actively listening to my voice and my story. And for that, I'm truly grateful. So finally, it's just not fair for our old people who have been through enough, who have lived hard lives and have made sacrifices for their families, only to suffer heartache as we continue to be the most incarcerated population in the world. We need to raise, raise the age. I want you to be advocating for this change to happen. The more voices that make noise, the stronger the message is heard. We need more initiatives like Aurora Education Foundation and Justice Reinvestment. We need to raise the age. We need to nurture, protect and guide our youth. We need to prevent them from entering our punitive system, justice systems. These are the interventions we need, not incarceration and increased funding to prisons. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jolie. That there, there's nothing more precious and important than hearing people's experience with the system and learning from that. And you have just expressed in such a way that is so accessible for us to understand um, and really hear the really important points that you made. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would just like to apologise to those people who couldn't get in at the beginning of the forum. We had extended our Zoom to 500 and then it decided it would create its own limit. Um, and so that's why there was a delay and people have been running around beside, behind the scenes here making sure that people did get access was an issue we thought we had fixed weeks ago. So apologies for those that arrived late. As you can see, we're making a recording, so you will be able to access the excellent uh, speeches and contributions that have already been um, made. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Jay Adanis from, the International, from International Health at Curtin University School of Population Health. Uh, Jaya is currently the Deputy Chair of the Curtin Academic Board Dean International in the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences. Sorry. That's the timer so I can time people's speeches. Apologies. Um, she's the professor in the Curtin School of Population Health. Since, 19, since 2018, she has led the uh, faculty global positioning portfolio and previously held the Director of Graduate Research role. In her 30 year career, she has worked in India, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Australia. She's received a national award for university teaching, is president of, it, of the Australian Graduate Women, and has been a delegate to the Commission on the Status of Women at the UN. 
uh, Professor Danis leads a program of research in refugee and migrant health, teaches in the P um, in the MPH program is an ex and is an experienced PhD supervisor. She's held new, numerous leadership roles and is eminently qualified to talk to us about the impact of COVID and what we should be looking for into the future as we come out of the pandemic. Over to you, Jan Jaya. Thank you very much, Rachel. And I'm really pleased to be here. I too would like to start by acknowledging the Wajuk Aboriginal people of the Noongar Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which I present. And I would like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, but more so as a migrant woman who has been welcomed in Australia, who has lived in five countries. My commitment to work with people from around the world is at the core of the work I do and reflects the values of respect, honesty, and integrity. I'd like to just take about a minute or so to talk about my own personal experiences. I grew up in India and left India as a young woman in her 20s. I had trained as a food scientist and I went to Africa. For the next 10 years, I lived and worked in Africa. My children were born in Africa. I lived through another pandemic at that time, which was the HIV pandemic and I lived across Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. I experienced the genocide in Rwanda, the end of apartheid in South Africa. And at that time, I experienced refugee and migrant movements with the impact of conflict-related trauma and displacement and the widespread violence against uh, men and women. So I grew passionate about global public health, education, and community links, you know, because these are the essence of the work that I do. But in the last 20 months or so, we've been in, immersed in the COVID pandemic. And I've been mapping the pandemic globally because of my interest in what was happening in India, in Africa, other parts of the world, and in Australia. And in, within Australia, I was looking at vulnerable populations too. You know? So when we had, what has happened in the last 24 months is 195 countries have been impacted by the pandemic we have had 511 million people who have tested positive to COVID. We've had 6.2 million deaths, but Australia has been spared. We've had a really strict COVID policy in terms of our border closures and in terms of our restricted movements. And in this time, since the start of the vaccines, we've had about 11 billion doses of the vaccines that have been administered to populations, but these have been contained in the developed countries. The developing countries have actually experienced vaccine inequality. And we have to see that vaccine inequality is reduced in those parts of the world. But in, in, when, uh, in Australia, when we look at Australia, we have different groups of people who have been impacted differently by the COVID pandemic and by public health measures that were imposed by our government. So we had our indigenous populations. We have lower vaccination rates in our indigenous population. The lockdowns negatively impacted indigenous populations because they like to meet with community. They like to have family gatherings. And the model of health is also community driven, community led, where there is, which could not happen during lockdowns, and this impacted the populations. Similarly, in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, living in cities, in, in our major cities, they were also negatively impacted. Many of them who did not speak sufficient English, did not have in access to possibly telehealth, wouldn't understand lockdown measures. These impacted these populations negatively. You know? Then we had the elderly and the elderly throughout Australia have been impacted. And we know what has happened to um, our, in our aged care facilities across Australia. The other, other group also that has been impacted is, is gender or women. So women have been negatively impacted by the COVID uh, pandemic, not only in Australia, but throughout the world. So in Australia, the lockdown measures in Australia and globally 
led to a spike in intimate partner and domestic violence throughout the world. So this was a reality that women who had to face, that they had to be locked now with their abusers. You know. The other thing is due to the casualization of the workforce in Australia, we had women who were negatively impacted when there were lockdowns and when smaller businesses closed down. But one of the things that is, I think, in some ways forgotten is that 70% of the frontline workers throughout the world and in Australia are women, but most of the decision makers throughout the world are male. So although there are leader, leadership in health throughout the world is lacking as far as gen, uh, gender or women go. You know? So these were some of the impacts that were felt with respect to health. Then came the vaccine distribution and there was vaccine hesitancy and disparities in our vaccine distribution. We've done well now in Western Australia and slowly we are opening, we are going to be op opening up as of tomorrow, you know, and with most of our restrictions easing. You know? But one thing that has, has happened which supported our population is the job keeper allowance that was given to most of the people during the pandemic. But this stopped in 20, mid-2021. And after this stop, so the job keeper allowance actually helped people on the lowest income, lowest income to, to do something extra, which they couldn't do prior to that because the job seeker or the prior new start allowance did not allow them to do so. You know? So these were some of the things that would, and, and then middle of 2021, we had the Delta variant and then the Omicron variant. So basically in the Eastern states of Australia, we had two other waves that impacted the population. So when we have, when we see this, one thing that I would like to now end in the next few um, minutes is about the social determinants of health here and how important they are in understanding the interrelations. The strongest indicator of health, social and educational outcomes in society are the social determinants of health. The economic, educational, environmental, housing, transport and social context that people live and work in. And I think my other panelists have alluded to this here. These determinants are responsible in the variation in disparities and outcomes. And the pandemic has highlighted the vulnerabilities and disparities in our communities. One of the things that our government has consistently said, especially the WA government, we are hesitant to open our borders because our health system is fragile. You know? But what I have seen as a global public health researcher in the last 24 months is that there has been difficulties or we have seen the difficulties in our aged care system, our mental health system, our hospital system, our indigenous health system, all of these systems, these systemic difficulties have come to the fore during the pandemic. What, what are the things that we require now as we go ahead? We need robust, we are, according to the OECD, one of the top 20 wealthy countries in the world, yet we have these gross disparities and inequalities that need to be reduced. We need robust systems of data collecting that includes comprehensive information. Not only we need on all the social determinants. So when we actually capture information, we need to capture information on housing, on finances, on food security, on nutrition, on transport, and the variables that measure structural racism in our systems, our health systems, our social systems and our community systems. We also need models that meet our health and education related community social needs. You know? and, uh, and I think you know, Mason and Jaylee have talked about this. You know? We need governments to engage across multiple sectors, you know, across the community sector, across departments where they talk to the housing departments, the health departments, the disability agencies, the indigenous communities together. We cannot do this in isolation. We really have to work together. You know? Now, the 2019 WA Sustainable Health Review considered these factors and it reports on uh, progress. 
But for me, it's more difficult to understand as to how efficiently funds are allocated to ensure a high level of service delivery that ultimately benefits the community and the consumer. Where are the funds going so that where it needs to trickle down at that level? So as a society, we have a collective responsibility for health, for education, for social, uh, social services. And our government needs to create the social purposes where we as people take responsibility for health and education and community needs. But these have to transcend an intergenerational continuum from childcare centers, from schools, from workplaces to the community. You know? And we need our government not to abdicate its responsibility to provide good social support at all levels as good societies are those who make wise choices and distribute resources fairly and equitably to reduce differences in health. So we need a model of health, social services and community care that requires long-term sustained in in investment to support the system design and efficiency in the whole system. Thank you very much, Rachel. Perfectly timed. Thank you. Thank you for your amazing contribution. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So thank you very much, Jaya, for your uh, time, for your speech. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, I now have some sad news is that unfortunately, Richard Dennis has had to pull out. He's had a family and medical emergency where he's literally had to rush somebody to hospital during this time um, but we do have um, the we do have um, Mark Glasson and Louise Diletto uh, to speak to you and of course we know that the rental affordability snapshot that Anglicare does every year was in fact just has just been released so Mark can talk to us about housing and then Louise We'll also uh, make a contribution around uh, around this housing issue as well, which of course is also extremely topical and is high on everyone's agenda at the moment. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Rachel. Um, can I say that no one's more disappointed about Richard Dennis than me? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a, a terrible thing. What What's happened is today we have released our rental affordability snapshot which is an annual exercise that we do that looks at available properties on any on a particular weekend, and it's usually March or April. And we look at those properties and we compare them uh, in terms, we, we look at them in terms of suitability for different family types on different income types. And we look at the size of the house for appropriateness in terms of, um, to, make, to make a judgment around whether a property is appropriate and affordable. So this year we did our survey on the 19th and 20th of March, and there were 3,457 properties available online um, during that weekend. So we, we, sampled, we took the whole lot of those and we did the assessment against those. Interestingly though, um, between 20 and 21, the number of properties available in Western Australia dropped by about 50%. And people will recall that that was during the height of the pandemic and, um, if there was the height, and um, at least in Western Australia. And um, it dropped by about half when we did this survey last year. We had, we did hope to see this year some recovery in those numbers, but unfortunately there wasn't. So the 3,457 was about 50% of what it was two years ago, which points to an issue for us around, around supply. But there are a few key takings that we, we found in the um, in the survey. Median rents have increased by approximately 50 bucks a week right across the state. So there was a 12% rental increase in Metropolitan Perth, 13 and a half in the Southwest and the Great Southern, and just under 10 in the Northwest. And median rent now in, in Perth, according to the stats we got, uh, is now 480 and it's 600 in the Northwest, a little bit less in the Southwest. The situation is desperate for people on low incomes. So for people on any form of income support, there's probably 1% of available properties uh, 1% of the properties were available for those people at an affordable level. We used the 30% uh, level of affordability. Uh, and so just 1% of the properties, 1% of those that 3,400 odd was available to a, a, 
uh, person on some form of income support. If you're on job seeker or youth allowance, the news is even worse. There was not one property in Western Australia, not even a room that would be available and affordable for a person on job seeker. So there are just no properties uh, for people on that level of income. As I said, um, the number of properties has ha halved over the last two years. Um, and the vacancy rate of hovering around 1% means that um, there's increased insecurity for people as well. What we found is that, the, the and Louise, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but the rising costs of other essentials are making thing, things worse for um, people who are in insecure accommodation. So it's all been, um, everything has been, I suppose, exaggerated by housing stress, and that's been um, compounded by spikes in food and fuel prices and things like that. We know that wages are still, still stagnant at 2 point something percent over the last um, 12 months. And the, the biggest issue that we've found is the private, the private rental market does not provide enough accommodation to meet the needs of most of the people that we would work with. So the private market can't, doesn't seem to be able to get products on, onto, onto the, I suppose, houses on, into the streets at a, a price level that people can afford when they're on very, very low income. So what we've got, that, that's what we found. We've been doing this for about 10 years now. It's a downward trend. It does point to the fact that our housing system is broken. Um, and that's been our message today. We need to take some really serious action to, to get more housing onto, onto, the, um, onto the streets and become available for people who need it. Our calls for action as a result of this to this year have been for an immediate relief like subsidies and grants. So we need to ensure that we can keep people where they are and recognise that people who do have accommodation, um, it's really important that we keep those people accommodated. So we're saying uh, once a family loses their accommodation, everything turns much, much worse and it gets much more expensive. So let's put some grants and subsidies in place to keep people where they are. We're calling for some rent stabilisation, some mechanisms to limit rent increases. And that won't be popular with everyone, but um, what we saw after the rental moratorium ended and what we've seen over the last 12 months is rent increases significantly higher um, than the CPI. And uh, so we're saying that really, we need to find some structural way to address those issues. And we're also saying, and this won't be a surprise to anyone, raise the rate of job seeker and Commonwealth rent assistance. As long as we're holding people below the poverty line, there's no, they have no opportunity to um, address the issues that, that the system is putting upon them. In the long term, we're asking for more construction of social housing. And for people who are here today, this won't be news for anyone. But we've, we've deliberately called for um, Commonwealth support, increased Commonwealth support for the state to construct more properties. Since Minister Carey has been the Minister for Housing, he's announced construction of about 3,300 new properties. I don't think any of them have landed yet, but they have been budgeted for and they're scheduled. So that's a start. But the problems that people are facing right now mean that a lot more people will fall into the gap of insecure housing and homelessness while they're waiting for those to be built. And really, we need probably 18,000 properties and we've got 3,500 on the, on, on the schedule. So we haven't touched the sides really. So what we've called for is a long-term investment, uh, consistent investment, generational investment in social housing, like has been done before, uh, but in the meantime, provide the income support for people who really need the assistance. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on, on that, Rachel. I will post the link to the report so everyone will be able to have a read to it. Thanks, Mark. The, the report's gone up. Um, your lovely offside of Miles has already posted that. And a huge thank you to Mark. If people could see us behind the screens, if people go, oh, my God, we had a, somebody pull out our economist. Um, literally, once the, the webinar had actually started, the good news for everybody on this screen, I studied two units at university on the on economics. So I'm full bottle. So, but I thought I'd actually, you know, somebody pulling out always then gives me the opportunity to then speak. Um, I said, I just wanted to touch on, it was really about the cost of living. Unless you're living underneath a rock, we've got a federal election coming up. There's 
you know, and this is going to be at the election in, in regards to the cost of living. I actually haven't seen a great deal about that or commitments from either side of our major parties for those who are most vulnerable in our community as yet. Um, and one of the things when we talk about the economy and people and human beings and the social, we often separate, not us, but the, the conversation's often separated. The economy on one side of the lecture and people's humans, social well-being is on the other side of the le le ledger and they do not intersect. Or even worse than that, I believe that we're actually like the community services and community service organisations or supports that are provided to the community are actually seen on the debit side of the ledger, that we a cost to the community. And I think that's what part of our jobs, and I am starting to see this change in some circles, is that we need to stop divide, dividing the two topics. The economy and people's social and community wellbeing do intersect. And we actually did see that through the lifting of JobKeeper and um, the introduction, uh, sorry, the introduction of JobKeeper and the, the lifting and doubling of JobSeeker. What we know in the community service sector, and we have the research to back it up through projects like 100 Families, it was the biggest boost to the economy and kept the economy stimulated. If you give the resources and funding to our lowest income households, they spend that money in the economy, but it also lifted many out of poverty that they no longer in the long term needed the support of organisations such as ours. And that's the outcome we're all aiming and working towards. In many cases, we don't want these vulnerable families and community members to be reliant on our services. So in the lead up to the federal election, and we know we've got our state budget coming down, I think it's the 12th of May, and predictions state there'll be about a $9 billion surplus. We have an economy that's doing extremely well in, here in Western Australia. But as announced yesterday, and again, unless you were living underneath the rock, WA is facing the highest CPI increase of 7.6%, just over five, sort of the national average. And so what Mark's just expressed, the biggest increase in the cost of living is housing. And the Anglicare report once again demonstrates if you're on any type of income support, you literally cannot rent a property here in Western Australia. And with um, what's predicted as, you know, the rises in interest rates next week, those vulnerable low income households who do have a mortgage, who may have overstretched themselves, are going to see huge jumps in their mortgage repayments. Therefore, we're expecting further stress on the emergency relief and the food system here in Western Australia. Personally, I'd like to put our emergency relief and our food system out of business, because if we simply supplied people with sufficient income and sufficient housing, we shouldn't have such a very, and it's a costly system. It's not a, it's a costly system. And people spend so much their time and their energy of actually seeking out that support. And we learned that through 100 families as well. So just to give you an idea, even if you're a renter and you've got a, you know, hopefully a decent price locked in your rental accommodation for the next six months, you know, groceries prices have jumped 4%, essential prices, essential goods, a further 6.6%. So no matter what, what we already know, and the evidence really has come down yesterday, the cost of living has shot through the roof. You know, it's, it's that we've never seen these jumps since, I think it was 2001, since the introduction of the GST. So unfortunately, your services are going to be seeing a much greater demand um, because communities and families will be suffering. And just to finish up, we do need to shift the conversation from a, from a cost to the public purse to an investment in our communities and our families. And it's that long-term investment in our communities and families so they don't need a social support or a safety net. And remove the silos from the conversations as well. Again, the economy, social support services. And it's one of my bugbears when I'm often hearing the conversations around because it's you know public, it's popular at the moment around gender equity and supporting families and family and domestic violence, but nobody actually makes the link between the income support that supply that's provided um, to a single parent 
or for somebody who's trying to escape FDV and the absolute fear of jumping into an entrenched poverty and the life that they will be actually providing for their children. And that's a barrier. It's time we start making those connections. So why not we? I would say um, some of our political leaders start making those connections in our community. So back to you, Rachel, because I think it's question time. Yes, thank you, it is. And can you join me in thanking Mark and Louise for jumping in at such short notice. I think it's the shortest notice I've ever seen any speaker uh, jump into a forum. So thank you uh, so much. And uh, I'm hoping people saw, but I'll just repeat it just in case. Chris, Jimmy put a message in the chat um, just saying that Richard Dennis has will record his contribution and once he's done that, we'll make sure it goes up um, on the website. So thank you to all our speakers, really fantastic contributions. It's now over to our audience for any questions for our speakers. And I might kick it off while people are thinking about what they want to ask and Mine's to you, Naomi. Um, Louise has just been talking about um, uh, the cost of the issues around cost of living, for example, and inflation and things like that. And we all um, we all are aware um, of those issues, and that it looks like they're only going to get worse for the foreseeable future. When we're talking about things like the impact of climate change and heat waves. What do you foresee happening for cost of living and particularly those trying to survive on low incomes? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, it's not even actually what's coming up, but what we're already seeing. So um, when a climate event occurs, whether it's uh, a heat wave, a flood, a bushfire, these, of course, cause a whole range of financial stresses for families that are affected. Um, now, when... Um, they're different, of course. So if you're displaced from your home due to a bushfire, uh, either because your house is burned down or because you're in a threatened area, you have a whole range of costs that you need to, um, to, to pay to either have alternative accommodation or um, you have lost work time. You know, these all have implications, of course. When it's an issue like a heat wave, when you're in your own home, there's, of course, you know, increased electricity costs with cooling your home, um, some of the implications of seeking out a cool place to be if your home doesn't provide that. You know, one of the issues that came out in some of the research by VCOS was that um, people on low income have less financial resources to do things like go to the pub or go to the cinema that are cool places to cool down during a heat wave. So that puts them at greater risk or, at, or at also at greater financial stress. Um, we know that the climate is a worsening that climate change is intensifying. We're going to be seeing more frequent and more intense climate events um, in the short and long term. And so, you know, what might have been previously called a one in 100 year flood is going to become much more frequent, which then means that families will be having in increased and intensified financial stresses in their lives. We absolutely need to be already doing the work but preparing for the greater financial impacts of climate change and the various types of events that will occur for families um, across a whole range of areas. Education access is one, of course. Um, when a climate event occurs, children and young people have less access to education that can either be disrupted or there can be um, huge difficulties in, in actually participating in education. That then has a whole range of implications for um, whether a child needs a tutor or, you know, having the funds to then access education if they're living remotely, this all comes into play. So um, in every single facet of the, way, the areas that we're working in, climate change is a reality and there are financial implications for our communities. Thank you. Um, I've got one for, uh, for Jaya, um, and you can probably see it in the chat. You refer to the... Um, SHR, the Sustainable Health Review, uh, for those that those of us that don't even breathe it all the time, um, and the need to develop a more holistic health model that integrates the social determinants of health. In your work across the world, have you seen a model that has worked or is worth looking at? Extremely good question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, is it Xenalad? Uh, 
With respect to the models, um, many countries are proposing some of these models. Some of the Scandinavian countries have very good models of social and healthcare. Uh, for example, they have childcare right until two years that is offered, you know, huge amounts of parental leave so that both the mother and both family, mother and the father can take extended leave. There was a recent article in uh, the in in the JAMA uh, recently, just a few weeks ago, and there was another uh, um, whole series of articles in the Medical Journal of Australia that looked at these models. You know, but ultimately, the accountability falls on the government. You know, and that is why it's important to realize that community organizations can only do so much. Ultimately, the responsibility falls on the government and it's important that the government recognizes this. Now, when we have the sustainable health review, this was recognized by our government, but uh, what we have felt is that when, we, when I look at finance, the financial, you know, how much is health spending in our budget, it's significant and high, but it's the efficiencies at scale. You know? Why is it that our uh, why is it there are problems in our best hospitals, you know, like the Fiona, Fiona Stanley Hospital or a Per Children's Hospital? Why is there ambulance ramping? So wh what is happening with the efficiencies of scale? And that is something we need to look at and do better in Australia. We don't need to, we don't do that very well. Like social housing, there's no, it's, it's not, it's a no brainer. We need much more social housing. And throughout the decades, I mean, I've been in Australia 20 years here, and I'm in my mid fifties, you know, before that I lived in five different countries. Social housing is really, really important. I grew up in India where we have disparities. There's no social security system. So everyone needs to work, but there's huge amounts of social uh, housing in the, in the big cities, you know? So this is um, uh, a concern. And I think we can do better with, with social housing, you know? and looking at better models of how, uh, social housing and cheaper housing also. You know? We are looking at such expensive house, house rates across our major cities, and that's unsustainable also. You know? And we are going towards this push towards healthcare that's, that's patient, where patient provides to the cost of healthcare. And that also is problematic and we need to change those models, but I'm not sure at this stage how we can do so without advocating for this really, really strongly. Our current government who in power does not see this as, as um, important in some ways, I feel. Thank you. Um, the, sorry, Rachel, I thought we'd yeah, take you it. Go for it. You go yeah, for we'll it. take it in turn. So first yeah. up, there's just a comment here, really pleased to see Anglicare um, advocating for increase of Commonwealth rent assistance rather than the continual demand stimulus that government seems to do. Um, and there's a question here from um, Naomi, from Chris Toomey. Do we need a minimum en energy efficient standards for rental properties so they don't cost a fortune to live in? In the ACT, you can't advertise for rental without its star rating so people know how much it costs. So what do you think, Naomi? <laughs> Tim, you need to unmute Naomi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that it's 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 so obvious. Absolutely, we need to have much greater um, regulations around rental properties. It's it's. I also because I'm involved in Just Home Margaret River, I'm really across the housing crisis as well, and the intersection of housing and climate is is a is a very potent mix. Um, we need to be seeing a minimum star rating for all rental properties and a, and a requirement for all landlords to provide rentals that are livable and affordable. And, um, you know, this just requires regulation. I, I think what we know is a, a key problem around the housing market is the lack of, a, the, the real reluctance in federal and state governments to actually regulate in these spaces, rather trying to leave it to the private market. In the context of climate change and, and in the housing crisis more generally, we absolutely need to have much better and fairer legislation that benefits our communities as a whole. Louise, do you have another one? Yeah, it's for Dr. Dantas. You referred to the Sustainable Health Review and the need to develop a more holistic health model that integrates the social determinants of health. In your work across the world, have you seen a model that actually works? What should we be looking at? 
I, I just uh, addressed that, Louise. I just Sorry. addressed that in my previous question uh, <laughs> with some countries that have have those models and and do well, you know, but uh, ultimately it's holding governments accountable and, and that makes it really um, difficult because governments use the whole notion of debt and, you know, from an economic point of view, understanding debt is very different, you know, it's very, very different. You might have debt, but you can't actually reduce services because what they then expect is they expect health hospitals, educational system, uh, uh, um, systems, as well as social systems to make a profit. And the moment you have that model where actual services make, need to make a profit, then the, the focus is on privatizing. And that's where the problem arises. And we've seen that. We, we do not need a model like in the United States where there's real inequalities in health. They have some of the best health systems in the world, and they also have quite significant disparities. We, we can't do that. And, you know, with, with climate, looking at the whole climate debate, you know, because in, in, coming from India and in Africa, you know, there's whole desertification of Africa. We have floods in India constantly at certain places. And, you know, the Green Belt movement in Africa, as well as the Chipko movement in India, started four decades ago. So developing countries were, were on this agenda about four or five decades. Suddenly, it's the developed countries that has taken the, this aboard. But as a young child in India, it was the Chipko movement where, where women were hugging trees, you know, so that trees will not be cut. And Wangari Mathai won the Nobel Peace Prize for her Green Belt movement, you know, in Kenya, where she was planting trees and she's passed away now. She was an environmentalist here. And we had Jane Goodall do that with the chimpanzees in Tanzania, when uh, long before all of this climate debate where people have ecosystems have to live in harmony with each other. You know? But we, we have now, we know this is an important issue, but we look at Germany. Germany has invested $60 billion over N number of years so that it actually addresses the issue of climate change. You know, it's governments that need to invest in this when it comes to the impacts of climate change. We see that. I mean, we cannot be in denial any longer. The, the evidence is there. The reality is there. It's the investment that needs to be made. And it's the sustained investment that's just not, <coughs> not there, you know? Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, Lou, you go. Oh, sorry. We were well coordinated here, I was, but I love to hug a tree, still do. My mum taught me to do that. Um, so Michael, um, this has come from Kim. So Michael Marthen states that children living in poverty is the biggest public health issue we, that is the world, face. How has COVID intersected with this in terms of evidence and further entrenchment of poverty related issues? And is there any thinking about the generational impacts and the ways out of the long-term and increasing linger pounded issues for, for children? Um, I think uh, it's, it's a difficult issue. What we are seeing, like we see you know, the best indicator of any country is how well its children do. You know? And we've heard Mason talk about our justice system and our indigenous children. But during COVID, I was also looking at children in India because we had the high amounts of deaths during the Delta wave, you know? and children lost their parents overnight. So they became more vulnerable. And what do you do in such a, such a system? But for me, out of, out of 22 years in Australia, for 17 years, I've also been a foster carer in the system, you know, in the Department of Child Protection. And so I know how difficult this is and how challenging it is for children who are vulnerable, you know? And it's entrenched intergenerational poverty. Getting people out of intergenerational poverty is really, really difficult when there are significant trauma-related issues, addiction-related issues, and uh, there's also uh, racism-related issues. And how we navigate those is something that we, we just need to do that. We are not doing that well. We are just not doing that well. And we know that from Mason's talk, from what Jay Lee said, you know, and we need to do that. But we, we have um, much more difficult indigenous um, child indicators in, in Australia where, where we need to do better, you know, but, but our indigenous populations throughout the world uh, do, do significantly, uh, disproportionately 
uh, poorly as compared to the other inhabitants of the, of the nation. So it's something that these intersections that we see that need to be addressed. And often there are no e easy answer because these are systemic issues. But what we need is we need systems to be talking to each other, you know, because they are all interrelated. We know now that it's all uh, interrelated. And Louise, as you said, you know, the for, for gender-based violence, you know, and I look at it from a CALD perspective, women cannot leave if they do not know if they'll have shelter. You know? So you need a package. At present, I was at another talk with, uh, where we are, doing a, we are doing a small project with the Department of Justice and the Department of Communities with looking at sexual and, and gender-based violence. You know? And what we find is, even this 5,000 allocated to women living violence, nobody knows how to navigate the system to access this 5,000. So that's the quagmire that people have to face. So how do they do that, that they can access this? So why are our systems so bureaucratic and more complex that they're difficult to navigate? I don't have the answers. You all have better answers because you all work much more at the grassroots level, but I do work at the com with, with communities and I find that challenging. What I find when I work with the Indian community or the Goan community or women, we, it's, it's the communities that come together to help rather than the government actually taking responsibility for, for something. So that's good in one way, but we, can, we, we need the government to take responsibility and act on it rather than shift that responsibility. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to our finish time, but there is a question that I think would go to a number of our panellists. Um, and Jay Lee, I might go to you first. And that's around, is there research on the intersections between housing affordability and contact with the justice system? Jay Lee, do you want to make a kick off the comments on that? Um, I'll That's jump in on this one, I think. Um, so yes, yeah. there is research on this link. We know that um, experiencing housing instability or homelessness means that you're more likely to be in contact with the justice system. You're more likely to be uh, represented in the prison population, but you're also more likely to be experiencing over-policing. So um, there's research that says that experiencing housing instability increases survival behaviours um, and those survival behaviours um, might be things such as you know, obtaining a shower or, or material needs um, or you know, seeking food, safety and shelter. Um, and a lot of these are actually criminalised in our society, in our community. Um, for young people in particular, I think it's really important when talking about housing and stability in the justice system is that this is a really critical time of development for a young person to learn safety, to learn curiosity, to learn in general, um, and it sets them up for a foundation of community connection. So experiencing housing instability at that age um, can have a really long-term and systemic impact on that young person um, that can lead to, to hard, more difficult outcomes and, and more uh, likelihood of engagement with the justice system for years to come. So if we're going to address youth justice, we need to address housing, um, as I mentioned earlier, and it's the same thing with mental health and many other areas. Thank you. Apparently, Jay Lee's having trouble unmuting herself. Tim uh, has... Uh, I'm good now. Oh, oh fantastic. Oh, Sorry. oh, there you are. I'm no. looking at you twice on the screen. I know. <laughs> okay. okay, sorry, I've just got to move. I, my mouse batteries ran out, and so I had to um, jump onto my MacBook. So, and then it was echoing really bad in there. Okay. We have all had these problems <laughs> with online, these online forums, so go for it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll just talk about the impact that um, homelessness or housing has on parents with children and especially going into the care and protection systems um, and coming out of Bankshire if they don't have a secure place or stable place to go to then they won't be bailed out or they won't be let out and also um, if they're being given bail to houses who may have a, an offender in that household or somebody else that's unsuitable for them to stay with, then these are conflicts and issues that are really hard to deal with um, departmentally. And I guess, um, so yeah, housing is at the crux of um, 
of stability for families and for children in care and protection and coming out of um, prison systems. Thank you so much. And again, highlights the issues that Mark and Louise were talking around about in terms of rental affordabilities and the essentialness of dealing with this housing crisis. We've come to the end of our time. Um, I think the issue that Deb Zanella had in the chat is also very important that conversation, changing the conversation around debt. And then somebody else suggested that we invite Richard Dennis back to talk about his new book. And that's a really brilliant idea as well. There's lots of questions in the chat now, and I'm really sorry we can't get to them all. Um, save them up and maybe you should have another forum to talk about some of these, some of these issues further. I like, I like the idea maybe getting Richard back and combining that with a conversation that's been suggested by De Deb about yes. debt and the yes. misleading of sort of how it's actually presented. I think yes. that's a really important one to have. He's, he's very good on those, on those issues, as I'm sure uh, most of you know. Um, I'd like to ask you all please to join me in thanking Naomi, Mason, Jaylee, Jaya, Mark and Louise. Thank you so much for your contributions. By looking at the chat, I'm, I'm getting the sense that people really appreciate hearing from you all. These are issues of our time. They are, some of them, while we call them emerging issues, uh, have been there for a very long time, but they're coming back to the they're getting a lot of attention now and they need even more attention. And that's our ongoing work as a, as a sector. So can you please join me in thanking our presenters so much? We really appreciate your um, time and commitment and very wise words. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's uh, very much appreciated. I hope that you've got a lot out of it and that it's sort of filled, sometimes we need this little fill up to keep going and hopefully hearing the commitment and the issues and what, you know, the things that we can undertake to start addressing some of these is help fill up that cup just a little bit more uh, just when we need it. So thank you very much for joining us today. And once again, thank you to our amazing speakers. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.